Hello. Today, um, I'm speaking with Dr. Mike Carragher, and I first want to tell you a little bit about ForeverHealth.com, uh, which is a network that we formed for all the people who want to know how to access this new kind of medicine but can't find a doctor who does it. It wasn't taught in medical school, so these doctors who are in the alternative and, and bioidentical hormone replacement world had to go back after spending so many years in medical school and relearn uh, and learn um, a whole new way to do it. So I'm always very admirous of um, doctors such as Dr. Carragher. Hello, Dr. Carragher. How are you? Hi. Great, Suzanne. Great to be here. Thank you. This is um, uh, today, we're going to talk about testosterone and men's hormones, although I understand that you also uh, take care of women, right? I do, yeah. I have about 40% right. uh, about of my practice is female, 60% male. Okay. Well, if you're any, um, any advertisement for hormone replacement, testosterone replacement, you're a very good advertisement. You look great. Thank you. <laughs> he's, he's 95 years old. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it, the new world of bioidentical hormones and hormone replacement has added quality of life to so many, and what we're doing today is trying to convey to others who have not jumped on this fast-moving train as to why they might want to do this. So if I were a man or a woman coming into your office today, and I can only speak from a female perspective. I would probably come in and say, I can't sleep, I'm gaining weight, I am bloated, I'm in a bad mood, I have zero libido, my hair is stringy, my skin is getting wrinkled. <laughs> what can you do for me? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, it's interesting, but both men and women come in uh, largely for the same complaints. You know, men come in, uh, they're typically... Uh, don't feel the way they used to feel when they were in their 20s or their early 30s. And, uh, you know, interestingly, uh, men who I'm evaluating are coming in at younger and younger ages. And we can talk about that at some point. But, uh, but men typically will come in and they'll, they'll say, I'm tired. I just can't, you know, I crash in the afternoon. I have a hard time getting going in the morning. Um, I used to want to have sex, you know, every day, a few times a day, and now my sex drive is just in the toilet. I don't even think about it, you know, um, have difficulty sleeping, either falling asleep or staying asleep. And, and those are kind of the base, or, or they're having trouble keeping muscular weight on and they're gaining, you know, fat around the middle. So I think the complaints, those main ones are, 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 are similar for both men and women. Well, I, I, I can relate with my husband who I had been on hormone replacement for years at that point. And I said to him one day, you're like our old cat. You fall asleep mid-morning. You fall asleep mid-afternoon. You sleep while I'm making dinner. You fall asleep after dinner. Then we go to bed early and you want to go to sleep. And I said, why don't you go to one of my doctors and get fixed up with hormones? And he did. And all he needed was some testosterone and DHEA. And it was like um, tulips that had, you know, well, I hate to use that analogy, that had uh, <laughs> fallen in the vase and now they're back up again. So um, it was life-changing for him. But here's the question that comes up all the time when I talk to men about hormones. I don't want to get prostate cancer. Can you dispel yeah. that myth? Sure, sure. It's interesting. You know, um, we used to think that testosterone caused prostate cancer in men. As a matter of fact, um, there was a gentleman who in the 1950s did the original research on that, uh, won the Nobel Prize for linking uh, testosterone to prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. um, that study was actually done in one patient, um, interestingly enough, and uh, and that has been that myth has been completely been dispelled. Now we know now not only that testosterone does not cause prostate cancer, um, but Abraham Morgenthaler, who's the sort of lead testosterone researcher um, at Harvard, is actually doing clinical trials of treating men who have prostate cancer with testosterone because we know that men who have higher testosterone levels have a lower incidence of prostate cancer. So uh, that that's been completely dispelled. That myth by now and, and and unfortunately a lot of old school doctors still uh, are of that mindset you know when I was in medical school and this was in the late 90s when I was in medical school we were still taught that testosterone caused prostate cancer and so if you if you're not keeping up on the literature and the current you know medical studies you'd still say that to your patients 
Well, I, 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 I know Abraham Morgenthaler, and he's done so much for the testosterone movement. I remember it was a few years ago, I think when I wrote my book, Bombshell, he called me and he said, I, I just completed a small but I think interesting study where he said, it didn't matter what, what stage prostate cancer men would come to my office. If I put them on testosterone in every single case, their, their, um, their cancer regressed or their PSA lowered and they went back um, to normal again. So I'm glad that you have this information. You're dispelling that myth, but it is really widely held out there with intelligent people and it's because of the uh, the lack t the lack of uh, keeping up in terms of the new information sure. so how do you administer testosterone let's talk mainly about uh, males today how do you administer testosterone to the male patient who comes in yeah good question uh there's a number of different ways to do it and it sort of depends upon uh man's age um and personal preference um if it's, a, if it's a younger male who wants to preserve fertility, okay, so we don't want their sperm counts to be affected and go down, then I'll typically use a medication called HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin, which stimulates a male's testicles to produce more of its own testosterone. Um, and it's a very physiologic way to, to increase testosterone production, and it also increases sperm counts, so it doesn't negatively affect uh, sperm counts. Um, once a man hits a certain age, um, the cells that actually make testosterone in the testes, are, there aren't, either aren't enough of, of them around anymore to make an adequate amount of testosterone, or they're not viable enough. And so in those cases, we need to give testosterone exogenously, meaning from outside the body. Um, and in that case, I'll either use a lipoderm cream, which is a very well-absorbed cream, which you rub on the skin, um, and use that twice a day. Um, or in some men, if they don't, if they just don't want to use the cream or won't use the cream, we can use injectable testosterone also. I do like the cream though very much. Um, uh, it, it's very well tolerated in men, and uh, that's usually the route I'll go unless they just refuse to put it on, in which case we'll use injections. And it hurts less. <laughs> it hurts less, yes. <laughs> so the, the thought process behind a um, hormone cream is that with every pulse of the body, it just... Uh, pours the hormones the way your body once actually did it, right? Yes, exactly. You get very uh, sort of, um, you get very steady serum levels throughout the day. You know, if you right. give an injection once a week, then you're sort of roller coastering your testosterone. And so by the end of, by the end of the seventh day, you're sort of at a trough of testosterone. So that's why you need to give another, another injection. You know, there's some doctors that give, that give, um, injections to their patients once a month, you know, and I think have they ever looked at a testosterone physiology curve? Like they're right. giving their, their patients are bottomed out for the last three weeks of the month, you know? Right. So. And of course, that's not how nature did it. Nature never said, oh, today's the day for testosterone and threw it all <laughs> in. Right, right. But there is a problem that I've heard from a lot of men is that the cream works, the cream works, then all of a sudden they stop absorbing. Have yeah. you run into that? I have, yes. And so uh, the key to that is, um, is rotation of the site, okay? Um, ah. Let's say a guy puts testosterone on his left inner thigh every morning, you know? Well, what happens after several months is the, is the testosterone receptors on the cells in that area, in that localized area, become resistant to it, okay? And so they become downregulated, and so, and so it doesn't work anymore. So usually what I'll have my men do is, is you know, Left thigh, right thigh, right upper arm, left inner upper arm. The scrotum is a really good place to put the cream because it's extremely well absorbed there. The scrotum is basically like a mucous membrane, and so the absorption's best there. Um, I don't advise that for men who are on alcohol-based gels because they can be irritating, but, uh, but as far as the lipoderm cream goes, which are the well-absorbed creams, it's rotation of sight that's really key. And it's interesting you say mucous membranes because for women, we absorb our estrogen and um, est estriol and uh, testosterone better through mucous membranes. So I hadn't thought of the scrotum as a mucous membrane, but now I learned something from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but it's not just testosterone for men, is it? There are other hormones that need replacing. Like what? Yeah, very true. Um, and, it, and it's one of the things that I like to talk about a lot because, um, you know, when men think hormones, they think testosterone mainly. Sometimes they think growth hormone, they mainly think t 
testosterone, right? And so um, as a result of that, there are uh, a lot of men who go to their doctors and say, I think my, I want my hormone levels checked, and doctors will only check their testosterone level. You know, you actually have these testosterone clinics, you know, these low T clinics that are popping up in strip malls all across the country that they'll, you go in, you see a nurse, they check your testosterone level, they check a PSA level, and if you're low in testosterone, they give you testosterone. It's really an incomplete picture, you know? I mean, as we know, the hormones really work like a symphony and they all interact with each other and certain levels of hormones make other ones go up or down. And so um, for men, it's looking at uh, their total and free testosterone. It's looking at their thyroid function. It's looking at their DHEA levels. It's looking at, uh, at, their, at their insulin and cortisol levels. You know, it's really, and looking at their IGF-1 to see where their growth hormone status is, you know. And so, so really getting a very complete picture um, of the hormones in men is, is just as important as it is in women. It's interesting because um, as much progress has been made, um, the buck still stops with, with men. So there's more stress um, in men's lives as a general rule than, than e even females. Although they say, I don't know who they are, that we experience more stress in one day in today's world than people of Elizabethan times did in an entire lifetime. So we're all bombarded. But there are other things that interfere with... Um, hormone balance and it can happen at any age right like the environment mm -hmm. yeah well there's these uh things called endocrine disruptors right and um and they're all around us right they're in they're in organophosphates they're in pesticides they're in um plastic water bottles you know that we drink out of they're um and i i don't know that they're even quite entirely avoidable in this world that we live in today you know right. But, um, but yeah, they, they, what they do is they attach to the receptors where a hormone is supposed to attach or a hormone precursor is supposed to attach, and they screw with hormone function, you know? And uh, so you have men and, and women who come in, you know, this is, this is um, I see this, you know, when I started practicing 15 years ago, men typically started coming in in their mid-30s, late-30s, you know? Now I see guys come in in their mid-20s, you know, 25, 26, 27 years old, and they have they have hormonal dysfunction. You know, they've got low hormone levels across the board, and you think, gosh, what is going on? You know, and you can only think that it's environmental. You know, they haven't had any any trauma or any you can't identify any overt disease that's causing it, right? And so, so that's what we're left with. Yeah, I notice uh, whenever I'm in New York City that um, the the younger people are worn out from uh, from the stress and probably. I don't know if you've been there lately, but when you look up in New York City, look up on top of any of the buildings, there are EMF towers, electromagnetic fields, and everybody's walking around with their cell phone, electromagnetic radiation. What's that doing to us? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't really know the studies on that, you know, um, and I, I've not seen them, but you can only imagine you're being inundated with these radio waves, you know, constantly 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whether it's from, whether it's from cell phones or whether it's from, you know, um, cable television or, or whatever it is, you know, and, and they, 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 you know, you talk about these very delicate, delicate molecules that, that are affected by, um, by electromag electromagnetic radiation, you know, and, and you can only imagine what it's doing to us, you know, I mean, you see that we live in such an increasingly toxic world, I, you know, I'm, um, that book Toxic that you wrote last year, it's, it's, I, mean, I think it's, 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 I recommend it to everybody because I think it's really good informationally for people to see. It was uh, very informative for me to write. It made me very aware of um, what we've done and where we are. But I always believe in never being hopeless. So it's like, um, if, this is, if this is what's coming at all of us, um, EMFs and ERs and, and uh, glyphosate and genetically modified foods and, and pesticides and all the things that we, our parents never had, uh, the only thing we can do really is take care of our own individual sphere, our, our family, our home, our environment. But a lot of men... Um, Probably millennials, uh, the 50-year-olds, are saying to me, where can I get a doctor to give me HGH, human growth hormone? Now, I'm a big proponent of HGH. I, I've been injecting for at least a decade, probably longer. And um, I like the way I'm aging, so something's working. Mm -hmm. But I look at these men, and I always say, 
you don't just haphazardly inject human growth hormone. So when someone comes to you and says, I want HGH, because all men think it's going to bulk them up and they're going to be more of a man, what do you say to them? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing I say is, you know, is let's look at a complete hormonal picture first. You know, growth hormone may be an issue, it, 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 you know, but it may not be your main issue, okay? Right. Right. Um, I always tell them that it is not a quick fix. You know, I'll have guys that'll come in to see me and they'll say, I want to lose this gut in six months. Can I take HGH and do it? And I'll say, there's a lot cheaper ways to do it than that, you know? So, um, and, um, and I'll, first off, I'll see what they can be doing. Usually what I'll do after I get a hormonal panel back to, with, from my patients, unless they're extremely low, is I'll optimize their other hormones and I'll say, let's recheck your IGF-1 level. That's the, that's the, the lab test we, we sort of monitor HGH with, right? And, um, and I'll say, let's recheck your IGF-1 level in 12 weeks after we optimize your other hormones, after we get you sleeping a little bit better, after we get you eating a little bit better, after we start exercising a little bit more. And I almost invariably see big jumps in IGF-1 levels alone, you know, and I'll say, at the very least, you'll need less and it will cost you less money, you know, so... Yeah. But yeah, um, that's, true. That's, that's what people don't realize. Like uh, I take uh, 0 0.08. My husband takes 0 0.04. Men need less HGH than women for some reason. So, um, you know, I'm not walking around like Arnold Schwarzenegger on 0 0.08. But yeah. I agree with you. And for um, all the people who are watching this interview, Dr. Uh, Kar Kerrigan is really right on. And in, 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 you have to assess the whole picture. It's not just throw in some HGH. It's what other hormones are you going to, to um, probably suggest to this person? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, thyroid's a big one. We see so much thyroid dysfunction, you know, it's a big one. And, in men uh, too. In men too. And, men, and, and you know, it, thyroid somehow gets associated with women all the time, you know. It's really right. kind of funny. Like, guys don't talk about their thyroids very much. Women always talk about their thyroids, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but guys, see, we see as much thyroid dysfunction men as, as we do in women, you know, and, and it's interesting thyroid. And most people say, Oh, I went to my doctor, my doctor checked my levels and he said I was fine. And then you say, well, yes, but you know, your levels may be fine, but you have, you know, one of the things that we're seeing more and more is that even with patients who have optimal, you know, T3 levels, T3 is the most act, free T3 is the most active form of thyroid hormone in the body. Even patients who have, who have optimal free T3 levels may just have, um, receptor level resistance, like we see insulin resistance on cells, we see thyroid resistance, and they may need two or three times more thyroid hormone than a normal person does just to sort of tickle those receptors to do the work inside to give them the results that thyroid, you know, gives them the benefits of, right? And so thyroid's a big one. DHEA is a huge one. Of course, of yeah. Excuse me, go back once on the, before we uh, finish with thyroid. Can you explain to the viewers the difference between low hypothyroid and high hyper? Yes, of course. Um, so when you think about a, a, a typical hypo or low thyroid patient, right? So our thyroid gland sits, it's two lobes and it sits right here in our neck and it helps to regulate our metabolism, right? It regulates things like body temperature and our metabolic rate and our pulse rate and, um, and our, our ability to gain or lose weight and sort of our, our energy levels throughout the day. And if you think about a person who is hypo or low thyroid, you sort of think about everything slowing down like that right <laughs> like they they tend to be to gain weight they tend to be constipated they tend to be tired they tend to be a little bit depressed right and if you think about a typical hyperthyroid patient or person whose thyroid is too high you think about a person who's had three you know 20 ounce vente coffees, right? They're sort of jittery and they're skinny and everything's shaking and they've got diarrhea, right? That's sort of classic hyper and hypothyroidism, okay? Um, Neither is a good scenario. Neither is a good scenario. Yes, neither is a good scenario. So we want we want the thyroid to sort of be at a, at, a, at a nice level where it gives you good sort of consistent energy throughout the day, right? It gives you a good metabolic rate where you're able to digest food at a nice rate and gives you you know gives you adequate sleep and doesn't keep you up at night and doesn't leave you jittery throughout the day. So if you're lying in bed and you your heart is racing, what does that say to you? 
Well, it could, if, if it's related to thyroid specifically, right? It could mean it could mean that you're that that you have hyperthyroidism or that you're overdosed on your thyroid medication, right? Okay. I mean, that that's specific. I mean, it could be a number of things. If we're speaking right. specifically about thyroid, that's what I would think about. Yes. Right. And so, um, I, 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 one person I'm thinking of um, this woman who's a dear friend of mine who comes into my home and what you love is her joy. Hello, beautiful. Hello, you're so great. Yeah, everything's so great. And she loves life. She's from Brooklyn, that kind of personality. And last year, she went into a major depression. And we're sitting in my dining room in Palm Springs, and it's hot. And she's freezing. She's got, there's a throw blanket on the couch, and, she, and she's got it on, and she's terribly depressed. And she usually loves to eat, and she didn't want any food. She's not interested. She lost her appetite, losing so much weight. And I said, boy, I think you should have your thyroid. No, it's not that. I'm just, I feel useless and all this. Um, it turns out that she was uh, minerally and nutritionally depleted and her thyroid was seriously affected. Have you had um, patients like this where they've turned into somebody else as a result of imbalance? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I'm thinking of one patient in particular, almost a similar type patient who, who, who I've taken care of for years, you know, and, um, and she moved away. And uh, I, I wasn't taking care of her after she moved in. She moved back to Los Angeles. She was working for a few years somewhere else. And she came back in and she had gained about 30 pounds, you know, she had this sullen look about her, you know, and she, she smiled because we hadn't seen each other in a long time. But we, you know, we sat down in my room and she, and she welled up and she just started crying. And she says, I felt horrible for the past year, you know, and, uh, and I said, listen, we're going to figure this out together, you know, and, uh, and we did some blood and we got her back together again. And yeah, she was, she was hormonally just completely depleted, you know, and, um, and she said she had an inkling that her hormones were deficient, you know. She went to see her, her new doctor, who was not a hormone specialist, just a regular GP, you know, who tested her levels, refused to put her on any progesterone, refused to put her on any estrogen, refused to put her on any thyroid because her levels looked normal, you know. Right. And, uh, and she came back and we took care of her and she's lost the weight again and feeling fantastic, you know. It's, it's, um, you know, it's sort of my mission to make that. I think that, that, that hormone replacement should really be standard of care in medicine. I think that as it, just like any of us, you know, as every, every single one of us get older, I think that every family doctor should be optimizing hormones in their patients. I shouldn't think there should be no question about it. I think that the benefits so far outweigh any risks, you know, and, um, and, and it's sort of my mission to take that, that, that message out there to people, you know, it's, bless, um, bless you, by the way, yeah. because, um, it's nice to be alive while we're alive and quality of life is everything. And so now they've extended life, which is great. We're all going to live to be 90, hundred. I was talking to Ray Kurzweil and he, he's going to live indefinitely. And I said, well, I can wrap my arms around 110. I really can. He said, okay, on your 110th birthday, if your bones are strong and your brain is working, you want that to be your last day. And I went, mm, no. So it's really about quality of life. Isn't it? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I tell my patients that in the first visit. I say, you know, age management medicine is not about making you live to be 120 or 130 or 140 years old. If you get there, great, you know. However, it's really about giving you the highest quality of life, right? As, so that the last 30 years of your life doesn't look like this on a quality of life curve, right? You know, nobody wants to spend the last 10 years of their life in a wheelchair being spoon fed and having their diapers changed and all of that. You know, we all want to go out and, you know, However long we live, you know, go out and play that last tennis game and then, you know, go to bed that night and hopefully not wake up or something, you know? I mean, that's sort of the ideal scenario, right? right. You know? But, but that's yeah, we, that's my, my sister who was, is a recovering alcoholic for about 40 years. I mean, it's just a real triumph. She said, I wish I could know my very last day because yeah. I'd get so drunk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, it's very uh, interesting to think about. <laughs> they want to know that it's it's for for people who are like uh, it's clear that you treat men and women, and the way the tenderness with which you talk about your patients is is very moving to me. Um, the the it must be very rewarding work for you to put Humpty Dumpty back together again many times a day, every day, right? 
Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a really good question or a good comment. You know, I, uh, part of the reason that I went into this field of medicine, you know, I was in medical school and residency and I was going through my training and, you know, you do these things called clinical rotations and you work in different offices every month and see patients. And it was like, I just didn't like the way medicine was being practiced. I thought, I don't want to be this kind of doctor. I don't want to walk into a room with a prescription pad in my hand and say, what's wrong? And I can only address the first thing that comes out of your mouth and I'll write your prescription for it. And there you go. And down to the pharmacy, you know, it just didn't feel authentic to me. It was not why I went into medicine. And at the same time, I was, you know, I was experiencing through my residency, I was experiencing the effects of hormonal decline. So I have a personal story attached to it as well. You know, I was, um, and I, I am a sort of product of hormone replacement, you know, and I have a very personal story related to it. But that along with, with wanting to practice preventive medicine in a way, I say, I think that if I didn't do this, I always think I would do ER medicine probably, you know, because they're, they're sort of fields where you can have an effect on patients immediately, you know, and, and we really can with hormone replacement, you know, I, I feel so confident that we can help patients really improve their quality of life and the bonus of it, put them at, put them at the lowest risk for chronic degenerative disease down the road. I want my patients at the lowest risk for heart disease, lowest risk for diabetes, lowest risk for osteoporosis, lowest risk for a stroke and cancer, you know, and, and, and if you get use the right hormones and the right amounts, that's what you get, you know? Well, I was just going to ask you to give me your final thoughts. That's pretty much a great final thought. If there's anything you want to add to that, I've, I've so enjoyed speaking with you. And um, you're a great advertisement for the work that you do. And that says a lot to me, too. The messenger must live the message. And uh, it's apparent that you do. It's apparent that you're eating right. You can tell by your your. The, the vitality in your face. Is there anything else that we didn't cover today? I mean, it's a big subject, <laughs> day, but anything Never. else? To, <laughs> when people look at this, um, uh, how can you make that final appeal to them of why you could be the doctor for them? Yeah. Well, I would probably encourage people, you know, if you, if, if you have an inkling that you might be suffering from hormonal decline, you know, go and see a doctor who specializes in, in bioidentical hormone replacement, Go to Suzanne's website, find somebody in your neighborhood, look me up and find me if you live in the Southern California area, you know, and, and but go to see somebody who's really going to evaluate your hormone levels and, 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 and take a look at, at, um, at your lifestyle, at your sleep, at your stressors and all of that and really address what's going on from some, from a comprehensive uh, stance because I think that's the only way that you're really going to get where you want to be. Well, I want to thank you very much. I'm talking to Dr. Michael Carragher, C-A-R-R-A-G-H-E-R, -R -E for anyone who wants to look him up. He's with the Forever Health Network. As I said at the beginning of this interview, foreverhealth.com is a network of physicians like Dr. Carragher who have gone back and learned this new uh, arena of, of um of bioidentical hormones and the chemical balance uh, within the body. And um, I am so pleased to meet you and so pleased that you're part of the network. And I'm so pleased to have had this conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay.